So today we are talking about inheritance and if you remember you get half of your genetic information from your mother and the other half from your father. Now if you remember what a cell looks like you've probably seen a nucleus and inside the nucleus you have almost these little squiggly lines or little black dots. Well what are they? Well they are your chromosomes. So this is what a cell looks like. This is our nucleus. If we take a closer look at our nucleus, we will see that there are strands of DNA. Now, these strands wind themselves up tightly into what is called chromosomes. And this we can see here. These are all uh, sets of chromosomes. Now, if we look at a chromosome up close, we will see that a chromosome is made up of two strands of DNA tightly wound up. This would be one strand and this would be another strand. On our strands of DNA, certain sections will code for certain genes. So this might be the gene for blonde hair. This might be the gene for green eyes and so on and so on. So along the strand of DNA, certain segments code for certain genes. Inside these is the genetic information that makes you, you. So chromosomes are made up of DNA. Each chromosome is actually one long strand of DNA that is tightly wound up in a chromosome. Now getting back to the inheritance part, you get half of your chromosomes from your mother and half your chromosomes from your father. And when these two halves of chromosomes meet, they become, you get one complete set of chromosomes. Now if you remember from the previous chapter, eggs and sperm are made through the process of meiosis. The parent cell divides through the process of meiosis and halves the genetic information to produce in males sperm and in females eggs. Now these two cells each contain 23 chromosomes. This makes them haploid, meaning that they've each got half the amount of genetic information of a normal cell. Now when our egg and sperm meet they produce what's known as a zygote. This zygote is diploid meaning it's got a full set of chromosomes which is 46 chromosomes. This means that diploid cells have homologous pairs of chromosomes which just means that there's two copies of each uh, chromosome which this is, would be one copy and this would be another copy and when these two copies uh, come together the chromosomes sort of look like an X. So after fertilization, after the two gametes, the sperm and the egg have met. We have what's called a zygote and the sperm and the egg each have 23 uh, chromosomes and when these two come together it makes 46 chromosomes. So the zygote has 46 chromosomes and when these, the zygote, the cells start to develop and multiply, uh, every single cell has 46 chromosomes because these cells divide through mitosis which gives you an exact identical copy of the parent cell. So one cell will become two cells completely identical. This is what it looks like. Okay, so when the, the egg and the sperm meet, they produce a zygote. This zygote divides through the process of mitosis which produces identical copies of the original cell meaning that they've got the exact same copies of DNA and chromosomes in the nucleus. Nuclear division gives rise to genetically identical cells. These cells will continue to divide through mitosis to produce a whole bunch of new cells and these cells form what is known as stem cells. They are cells that are not differentiated yet. They are essentially cells that can become any type of cell in our body. For example, these cells can differentiate to become skin cells, muscle cells, bone cells or blood cells. Once a stem cell is differentiated to a certain type of cell, it can't go back to a stem cell. These cells will then produce more uh, of the same type of cell. So if a stem cell over here 
differentiates, differentiates to a muscle cell, this muscle cell will divide to produce all muscle cells. On the other hand, meiosis is the process by which cell division takes place to form gametes. So meiosis is only involved in the production of gametes because it halves the genetic information. It halves the um, chromosomes inside the cells to produce eggs and sperm. Mitosis is used for growth and for repair as well as reproduction, asexual reproduction in plants for example, but meiosis is only used for um, gametes. When it comes to inheritance, we get certain genes from our mother and certain genes from our father. This, the combination of these two genes, or the two sets of genes, um, make up the zygote which makes up us. And that, that is why we have certain traits or characteristics rather that we get from our mother and certain that we get from our father. Okay, so we're going to analyze and take a look at the example in the book uh, about the chinchillas to take a look at how alleles and genetic uh, variations come about. So here we have a couple of different uh, genetic possibilities when it comes to chromosomes. For example, on our first chromosome here, we have identical copies, meaning that the gene coding on, for this, on this uh, leg of the chromosome, if it codes for G, the same area on the opposite side will code for exactly the same, uh, which is capital G, giving us the genotype GG, both capitals. On a different chromosome, we might not have identical genes. The gene on the one side might be capital G coding for uh, gray and the um, lowercase g on the other side might, might uh, code for charcoal. This is an example of heterozygous and when the genes are identical, it's an example of homozygous. Now G codes for gray fur capital and lowercase g codes for charcoal fur. So taking our examples over here, what will be the, the phenotype which is the physical uh, expression of the genes? What color fur would, be, would these animals be if they had this set of uh, genotype, this genotype or this genotype? For this genotype, what would the phenotype be? So over here we've got capital G and capital G. I made a mistake there. This is two capital G's. This would be our chromosome number one. So we've got the genotype GG. What would the phenotype be? Well, the animal would have grey fur because capital G stands for grey fur. But when we take a look at our genotype capital G lowercase g, what would the phenotype be? We write dominant alleles as capitals. So these are two dominant alleles and they both code for the same thing result. So the result would be the um, what they stand for which is gray fur. But when we have a dominant and a recessive um, allele, the phenotype is always what the dominant one codes for. Thus the dominant one codes for grey fur. So our animal here will have grey fur. If we have a genotype of two um, recessive alleles which is written as lowercase, the animal will have the recessive allele um, phenotype which is charcoal fur. So if there's a dominant and a dominant, the dominant one will obviously be the uh, phenotype. If the genotypes are dominant and recessive, the genotype will always be dominant. If the genotype is too recessive, then only will the recessive gene be expressed. So only in cases where the two recessive genes are recessive genes expressed as our phenotypes. Now we're going to take a look at if two um, chinchillas had to have babies. So here we've got our dad and here we've got our mom. So our dad has the genotype G capital and G lowercase. So as previously discussed, the dad here would have grey fur. 
because the dominant gene codes are gray fur. The mother has two recessive genes. So this is the only case where recessive genes are phenotypically expressed. So the mother would have the charcoal fur. Now if the mother and the father had to produce gametes through the process of meiosis, they would half their um, genetic information. So they go from having 46 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes per cell. This is meiosis. When these cells are split in half, in the father, he, the sperm, one sperm would be capital G and one sperm would be lowercase g. And in the mother, uh, one egg would be lowercase g and the other egg would also be lowercase g because she has two of the same uh, recessive uh, genes. When we write out a chart like this to determine the genetic probability of their offspring, we, this would be our mother and this would be our father's genes. So if this egg had to meet up with this sperm, this would be the resulting zygote. If this egg had to meet up with this sperm, this would be the resulting zygote and so on and so forth. So here we can see we've got two of the same and two of the same. So if these, either of these um, two cells meet, this, if this cell and this cell or this cell and this cell had to meet, this would be the offspring. This genotype um, stands for the phenotype of gray fur because it has the dominant allele for gray fur. If this egg had to meet with this sperm and the, or this egg with this sperm, then we ha would have the these two genotypes which contain both a recessive allele cap, uh, lowercase g and that would stand for charcoal fur. So you have to get used of this idea that not all of your genes are being expressed. You might for example have blonde hair uh, but actually you've got certain genes that code for brown hair. These genes just might not be dominant. So even though you've got the gene for brown hair you might not uh, present that you might have blonde hair. Now the difference between genotype and phenotype is genotype is all of the, is the complete set of genes that you have. So it uh, basically accounts for every single gene that you have in your body. It is the gene for blonde hair, the gene for brown hair and all of your other genes combined. But phenotype on the other hand will only be the gene for blonde hair because phenotype is the genes that are being expressed. Alright, so let's take a look at how DNA translates to proteins. This process is called protein synthesis. It is how the, um, the code, the DNA code gets read and how proteins are produced using the blueprint, the DNA, to make specific proteins. So if you remember, our DNA has certain bases and these bases are the C, T, G and A and they are your cytosine, guanine, adenine, adenine and thymine. Now, why these bases are so important is because when they were combined in what is called a triplet, so that's three, when they were combined in sets of triplets, they uh, code for a certain um, amino acid. When three base pairs, adenine, cytosine and guanine for example, are paired in a triplet, they code for one amino acid. So if this is the amino acid, this is our base pair, these will code for this amino acid. If we switch up the um, order in which these triplets are arranged, they can be the same letters arranged in a different pattern then they code for a different amino acid and a different amino acid is linked to the protein chain. How does this process work? Well, in the nucleus we've got our chromosomes and these chromosomes are strands of DNA. Now when we, our cell, uh, gets a signal to produce a certain protein, sections of the DNA that are going to be used unwind and the, then a complementary strand is formed and this is called messenger RNA. This strand is formed by pairing the base pairs with their corresponding base pairs to produce a sort of negative copy of the DNA. This messenger RNA strand then leaves the nucleus and goes to the ribosomes 
The ribosomes are where protein synthesis occurs and in the ribosome, the ribosome will read the messenger RNA strand and as the messenger, so if this is our ribosome, we've got our mRNA and as it goes us through the ribosome, the ribosome will attach amino acids to each triplet as each triplet presents itself and the, the ribosome then joins these amino acids together until the whole chain is complete. This chain will then fold in on itself and um, form a part of a protein. Alright, well I hope you guys enjoyed today's lesson. Good luck with studying and go and get those good marks.